Welcome everyone. Welcome to Product School. And thank you for joining me today on this topic on leveraging objectives and key results towards product development. So before we get going, I wanted to give a quick intro. My name is Yogesh Ratnaparki and I'm a principal product manager at Microsoft. Since joining, I launched a V1 product for OneDrive and SharePoint, which has been adopted by thousands of enterprise customers worldwide. My journey of product management though began at a local startup, which recently went IPO. There I launched several V1 products ranging from API-based platform to UX products on web and mobile. Working at a startup and at large tech companies, I learned many valuable lessons along the way. And if there is one thing that I took my heart is what's considered a product management success? What's considered a product management nirvana? And here's my three pillar definition of a happy product manager. First, a product manager is responsible for delivering tangible concrete outcomes or value to the organization. A value or outcome could be measured via the revenue, the number of users, reduction in cost, or customer satisfaction. It really varies based on the type of your product, based on the phase of your product, the type of your organization, or the market you are in. But making sure that you're consistently delivering this value is key part of a product management success. And in order for you to deliver this value, you need to establish a strong alignment with your stakeholders, including your leadership team. That way you can be sure that you are not only delivering just any outcomes or any value, but the right outcomes, the one that jive with your overall business strategy and the company culture. And finally, you want a cross team ownership where everyone in your product team is excited and inspired towards the product vision. Now, why is that important? When everyone owns the product, they bring their best. The designer wakes up thinking how she can improve the UX towards the final outcome. And then the engineer lays a strong foundation towards the long-term vision of the product. So that's how I measure my success as a product manager. While this is a lifelong pursuit, there are definitely frameworks like you can leverage to get closer to this ideal state. So to understand this framework, let's take the classic shopping cart scenario, which typically looks like this. So once an item is added to the cart, customer proceeds to checkout, add shipping details, payment details, review the order, and then clicks the checkout button, and they get a nice confirmation of their order. Imagine you are the product manager for this checkout experience. You're responsible for the success of this checkout process or checkout product. So based on your assessment and the discussions with your business owners, you define your success as improving the checkout rates. Now let's say the checkout rate is defined as the conversion from a point an item is added to the cart to the final confirmation step. So you set this goal, you get everyone sign off on this primary outcome for your product. I mean, who doesn't like more checkouts, right? Now you can assess opportunities, ideas, solutions against this feature and start building a prioritized roadmap. For example, Apple Pay seems like a promising way to give more choices, more payment choices to the users and in turn help improve your checkouts. Your engineering team has been proposing to upgrade the checkout APIs which promises to be more robust and fewer errors and seems like a great way to impact your checkout rate. There's yet another idea of expanding this experience on Android devices, for example, to increase your market share. Now, this is a great strategy. In theory, you're off to a great stack. In fact, this approach is better than listing just listing a list of features, getting excited about it without worrying about the goal. So in theory, you define your goal, you're doing all the right things, you got your stakeholders to nod on this goal, 
you prioritize these features based on this goal. And if you deliver on this roadmap, you are off to success. So did we get any closer to the Nirvana with this approach? Yes and no. Here's the problem and here's why. In reality, you have often multiple fuzzier goals. And the feature are almost always a set of hypotheses. Meaning you're not sure if the feature will indeed deliver the outcome you're after. And the feature are so disjointed or so, no, if not disjointed, if so far from the goal, it's, it's harder, it's not easier to measure the impact of these features against the goal you, that you're after. So how do we upgrade our approach? How do we upgrade our technique so we can be more confident that the product strategy will indeed drive the results that you're after at each phase of the product development cycle? And that's where OKRs come into play. So OKRs stand for objectives and key results. The objective is the top outcome that you want to achieve and key results are the interim milestones or sub outcomes that when achieved will move the needle on the parent outcome. So our goal now becomes the objective, which is to increase the checkout rate. And then we identify a handful of key results or KRs that will deliver our objective. To get the key results in our case, we ask ourselves a question. What needs to happen in order to improve the checkout rate? Well, if we reduce the number of clicks leading to the final checkout, we would have fewer drop-offs along the way. The customer will have an easier time to the checkout process and thus lead to a more successful checkout overall. So that becomes our first KR or key result. Similarly, if we reduce the drop-off at the payment screen, which is a typical bottleneck for e-commerce products, then again, we'll impact the checkout rate. That makes it for our second KR. And finally, if we improve the overall customer satisfaction, then also we'll improve the total checkouts. Now, this particular KR could be measured via survey on the post checkout screen. Notice we haven't mentioned a single feature yet unlike our previous strategy. Instead, we broke our goal into granular measurable outcomes so that we can easily track our goal and we can even start ideating features that, that can more easily map to our outcomes. And remember, key results are inherently measurable. So it's easy to quantify and prioritize them and which makes it easier to get alignment with your team, your stakeholder, or, and everyone involved on your overall strategy. More importantly, you yourself feel grounded in reality and feel connected with your business outcomes. So that's how you break your goals into OKRs. Now, now that we have established a great strategy, how do we apply this framework to the rest of the product development cycle? In a typical product environment, you usually start with a strategy, which we just did by setting our product OKRs. I mean, there's more to do in a strategy, but you already laid a great foundation for that. The second thing is we build, groom, and prioritize our backlog. The third, we take the top backlog items to a quarterly planning meeting with our engineering teammates, with our stakeholders and leadership. And fourth, we start building this product that we committed to or the list of features that we committed for a specific quarter or semester. And then finally, we launch these features or the product. Having OKRs as our strategic foundation we already taken good care of the step one, as I mentioned. Now we are ready for step two, which is to build our backlog. So to build our backlog, you put the objective at the top, as you can see in that orange bubble. 
And then the key results are the second level nodes in the blue boxes below it. And then you facilitate the brainstorming with your team, ideally focusing on one KR at a time. You let the team come up with solutions that could potentially impact the specific key results. Remember, we want to foster creative. We want the team to own the solution space. And to do that, you want to make sure you include representation from design, engineering, data science, and extended teams like support, customer success, and even legal teams based on the type of the product. You could even invite your partner teams. Like in this case, let's say we want inputs from the payment team. We should invite them into this um, brainstorming session. Now this process fosters creativity and ensures a diverse perspective from everyone involved, but making sure that you keep the conversation focused on a specific key result. For example, your design team has already been proposing to revamp the checkout experience. Now equipped with this key result, they can now refine the scope to deliver the specific outcomes we are after. And you can, you can then repeat this for other features. And then you can finally repeat this for other key results and build a super objective and organized backlog as you can see here. You don't always have to start with a new brainstorming session. It's common to have a backlog built through conversations with customers or with your internal teams. And then you can use this process or this opportunity tree framework, which was originally uh, formalized by Teresa Tors to actually organize your backlog around your OKRs. And now that you have the first pass at organizing your backlog, you're ready to start stack tracking them against a specific KR. There are proven techniques to help you achieve this. First and foremost, make sure to add key instrumentation or telemetry if it's not already available. You can't truly really improve anything if you cannot measure it. So make sure your first priority is to add all the key things that you want to measure. This could also mean investing in a good dashboard that will help you to see how you're doing on a specific key result. Second, you want to make fact-based data-driven decisions. You probably heard this phrase several times, but you cannot still overstate it. And now that we have a crisp key result to focus on, in this case, let's say it's the first KR, which is to increase the checkout rate, it's much easier to now be fact-based when you're evaluating different features against a specific KR versus comparing with the overall objective that we did in the, our very first uh, approach. And third, you want to apply the 80-20 rule whenever possible, which means favoring features that apply to 80% of customers or 80% of scenarios. This will ensure that you're investing in features that make the most impact. And finally, you want to fail fast by validating your hypothesis as early as possible. For that, you could do user studies or prototyping, or you could do A-B testing so that you can be sure before doing a full deployment, you have did all the new, all the due diligence to pre-validate a feature and to assess it against the key result that you're after. And then you can put this backlog into your existing issue tracking system like Jira. Most issue tra tracking systems offer a hierarchy like Epic being at the top, and then you have features underneath it, and then you have multiple stories to support that feature. You can leverage this existing hierarchy to plug your OKRs into the system. For example, your Epic is now your objective, which is to improve the checkout rate. And then your features are really the key results that will make this objective happen. If your issue tracking system doesn't support OKRs, um, then you could be creative. You can use custom tagging within the issue tracking system, or you can add custom fields to make sure you every issue or story or feature is mapped to the key result that it's tracking. And with that, you're done with the second phase in the product development cycle, which is to groom and prioritize your backlog. 
The next phase is to build a three to six month product plan. Having a solid objective for backlog we built in the last step, you're now ready to have an OKR driven product planning session. What that means is as a team, you can propose the features you want to build, but more importantly, you commit to the key results for the planning quarter. And now you can put actual numbers on your key results with reasonable confidence, thanks to the feature validation work you did earlier. For example, you as a team now could say, in Q1, we'll reduce the number of clicks by X percentage, along with the list of features that will drive the features, that will drive the key result. Now, this is a great way to hold yourself accountable for the actual outcome and not just features. And then the team feels ownership of the features they're committing, A, because they were part of ideating this, and B, they now really understand why they're building specific features. And since you already plugged OKRs into your issue tracking system, you can build chart, charts like the one you, that you see on the right side, where you can break your story points or issues by key results and ensure that you're investing in the same uh, proportion that you intended. Your investment portfolio that you see here shows that you're investing more in the key result one. And that's what that's exactly you wanted because you know that will have more impact on your overall checkout rate, for example. So using charts like this, you can actually validate that your planning is aligned with your strategy. Now, one, and once you have a sign off on this plan, you can start executing. But having this objectified framework or commitment will help you get a better sign off and easier sign off from everyone involved. Now we are ready to execute our commitment for this quarter or whatever timeline that you agreed upon. Again, you can continue to leverage OKRs throughout your product development uh, process of building this particular feature set. And make sure that you use the OKRs to course correct your feature strategy. Remember, your commitment is for the key result. Example, your commitment is to reduce the drop off, of, drop off at the payment screen. You're not so much tied to the features. So if your learning evolves throughout the quarter based on whatever test you did, based on whatever limited deployment you did of your features, you could course correct your feature strategy you could fine tune some of the feature scopes based on this learning so that you can stay as close to delivering on the key results as possible. You can drive the key results. Uh, you can drive the daily and weekly discussions with your team using these key results to um, address dilemma that may happen or scope decisions. And finally, as your sprint progresses, as you burn down your backlog, make sure to supplement the speed sprint reports with the KRs that they are after. Even if you didn't make the KR, it's important to include them so that you remind the team and everyone um, that's listening to this uh, sprint progress reports to understand why we are doing specific key results and how close we are to actually achieving these outcomes. So that was the fourth step and the fifth and final one in this cycle is to actually launch your features. Based on your agile practices or your release cycles, you may be launching features daily, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly. Regardless, make sure that you document your launch dates so that you can attribute the key result impact as the feature gets adopted by the customers. Most key results will not be uh, impacted right away after you deploy the product there will be a delay uh, by the time you actually see the result, but it's important that you document this so you can start attributing the impact of something that you launched maybe a week or two weeks ago to the results that you're seeing now. And then as you have, um, as you close on sprints and move on to the next and you do your sprint retro, meeting, sprint retro meetings, make sure you use the key result as a way to drive this discussion. If you didn't meet the KR, ask yourself, why didn't we meet this? Is it because it's too early? Or is it because our hypothesis were in, was incorrect? Or our feature fell short of making a specific key result impact? 
Regardless, make sure that you bake your learning into the overall process so that you can continually evolve, adjust, and make sure that you get closer and closer to the key results that you committed at the beginning of the quarter. And then as you launch features and you, and you communicate to everyone involved, make sure you mention the key results. If you meet the numbers, it is a great way to encourage and energize the team because not only did they launch features, but now they know that they made a meaningful impact towards your company or to the customers. And there's nothing more rewarding than seeing this impact. And again, it goes back to making sure that everyone in your team is empowered and energized towards the long-term product vision. So did the OKR framework take us any closer to the product management to Varna? Let's see. We want to deliver value to the business. And by keeping OKRs at the core, you ensured an outcomes-driven strategy from day one. And then you used OKRs to drive engagement at every stage of the product lifecycle. That way, everyone was aligned, everyone was informed, and everyone was on board on why we are doing certain things and how we are doing it. And finally, by offering a guiding framework, you empowered teams and drove ownership to ensure a lasting product impact. So that's my take on applying OKRs to product management principles and taking you closer to your own product management nirvana. So before we open for questions, I want to call out a few common fit pitfalls when applying this framework in product management. First, don't let great be the enemy of good. Don't let perfection limit you from applying this framework. If you're new to this approach or if your team is new to the approach, start small, start simple, be incremental in your approach. And as you apply this framework, don't insist on micro prioritization. Don't boil the ocean to set the exact key results. In my experience, these things evolve with time and experience and application. So get started and then uh, commit to a continuous improvement and then you will be successful in actually leveraging this framework to its best. Second, make sure to close the loop. Teams get excited about OKRs in the early phases like planning or grooming, but then as the sprint progresses, they forget to track the metrics and measure the impact of the product. So it's important to report back on the key results, even if you didn't make the target, that's okay. That way you can adjust the strategy and get back on track. Finally, OKRs is a means to an end. It's a framework, it's a guiding principle. The best innovations often are bottom up, come from the teammates uh, that, that, that are closest to the core base or closest to the customer. So make sure you foster creativity instead of stifling it by enforcing a top-down approach. So if a teammate proposes a great idea, that is aligned with the overall mission, but doesn't fit any of the key results you have, maybe it's time to evolve your framework itself. Maybe it's time to introduce a new key result or even a new objective. But as long as it jives with your overall mission or vision or strategy, make sure that you're inclusive of all these great ideas. In short, you wanna keep the framework living and breathing so that you get the best out of it. So that's OKRs in product development. Thank you. Thank you so much. For, um, thank you so much, Yogesh. That was a great presentation. Um, so to everyone, we now have some time for a few questions. And I see that there's already a few in the chat. So feel free to turn off your mic to ask a question directly. Or if you don't feel comfortable talking, or if you would rather use the chat, then that's fine as well. So we'll start with the first one that's here um, um, that says, at what point should we determine if the features identified or backlogged will help meet the objective? And then waiting to build all features first might not align with the fa fail fast approach. Thoughts? Got it. So the first question was, at what time should we start um, evaluating a feature against uh, a key result? So um, I think 
as early as possible. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in the previous, um, previous slides, you want to take a first pass at kind of organizing your features based on a little bit of a subject to maybe a judgmental approach. But then once you have your first pass, that's a great opportunity uh, right before the planning session. Because remember for planning, you're bringing your top features and you're also committing to the care. So right before planning, that's, that is the time to make sure you have as much validation done as possible. And usually let's say you're planning for Q2, Q1 is a time for product managers and designer, or maybe the engineering lead to start um, grooming your Q2 backlog. And that's where you're doing some sort of pre-validation. So by the time you're ready for the planning, you have done enough validation and homework so that you can actually uh, evaluate the impact to the specific care with uh, reasonable confidence. Hope that answers the question. And what was the second question Nikkei forgot? Second question was, um, waiting. well, I think it was more of a statement, waiting to build all features first might not align with the fail fast approach. And what are your thoughts on that? Waiting to build all the features, definitely. No, we definitely don't want to wait for all the features. Um, in fact, as I was saying, even before you build features, you want to fail fast. Like there are multiple ways you could learn about uh, a feature's potential impact uh, by doing testing or prototyping or deploying it to a small set of subset of customers with a limited scope. And then you kind of start evaluating. So in some ways, this discovery pre-validation is happening continuously as you're getting ready for your next quarterly planning. So yes, it has to be incremental. You're not waiting for all the features to be deployed. Hope that answers the question again. Okay, and then we have um, someone wanting, if you could maybe go over the slide that uh, mentioned the percentages with, about product planning and communication, um, if you don't mind. Sure. Getting a little pressure on that one. This one? We can't, I don't know. Does, can anyone see the screen? Let me see. No, no, let me, let me get back on the share. One sec. Is this the one? I believe so. Yeah, that's one. Got it. And what's the question on this? If you could, uh, uh, Anand, if you had the question about it, or if you want, um, I think just to kind of go over it one more time to clear things up. Sure. Um, so this slide demonstrates or uh, gives a sample of how you could commit to specific key results for an upcoming uh, quarter. So idea here is, let's say you identified reducing clicks as one of your KRs. Now you can actually start putting numbers on it. So let's say you determine that in your new UX that you're proposing, the, instead of 20 clicks, now you're gonna have say 10 clicks. So you could actually now say that you will reduce the clicks by 50%. Again, you don't have to be um, exact at this. You want to be a little bit aspirational. In, in this case, it's more, object, um, it's more objectified, but there are other times where you want to be more aspirational. But the idea is based on the validation you did on the features, you have some sense of what impact you would make. Let's say there is an error that is happening on 20% of scenarios. And you know that if you fixed it, you will have a 20% more increase in the success rate. It's okay to actually put 20% there because that's how you know that you know, you're gonna make an impact on the key result. I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Great. All right. So we have time for a couple more questions. Um, and also, if anyone wants to speak up, just go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask. Uh, yeah, Nikki, I can ask a question here. Uh, hi, Yogesh. Vishal here. Uh, thank you for this great presentation. Uh, very quickly, uh, I always hear that uh, uh, there's always a recommendation that your OKR needs to be very aggressive. And it should be set in such a way that if you are every time you are consistently achieving them 100%, it means there is a problem. So, yep. so from your perspective, what, what formula you suggest, you know, how aggressive that should be? Uh, you know, I want to understand, you know, because you have been using this uh, tools and techniques. So what, what do you recommend there in that, in that area? Absolutely. So KRs are meant, you, meant for you to be aspirational, right? And uh, you definitely need to have at least one or two key results that are moonshot. 
So when you think of Moonshot, I think there is no formula. It's more like what really inspires the team without losing touch with the reality. So you want to have uh, key results that in, excites the team, but at the same time, the team feels that that's actually achievable. If you know, if we did all the things, and if we have a little bit of a luck, you know, we'll get it. I think that to me is the kind of formula in some ways, and it depends a lot on the culture of your team. If you're working with a conservative team who take pride in delivering what they promised, and if you're introducing framework new, it's okay to start with more rooftop cares, which are more realistic, and start slowly introducing more moonshot. And if your team is over optimistic, maybe it's time to tone down down that a little, little bit. So, so that's my take. Uh, Vishal, I, uh, does that answer your question? It, it does, and thank you very much. Um, yeah, th this this answered my question very well. So, just kind of a quick one follow up uh, or related question here. Um, when we set the OKR, uh, again, it all depends on the organization and the culture. But but just from your perspective, uh, should we kind of target this OKR like quarterly, or you suggest? You know, Sometimes it's too short period, you know, it's too, become too difficult to manage. So what's your kind of suggestion there? Yeah, um, I think you broke a little bit, but I, I got the gist of it. Uh, you need to have enough uh, time frame that allows you to launch something, measure it, and see the impact. And in most cases, it's usually three to six months. So in most scenarios, again, it really varies with the organization, but usually you want to set OKRs for the next uh, one or two quarters. Now, there are teams and they, there are products which are super aggressive by nature. So for example, if you're in a marketing team and you are you have aggressive built-in A-B testing campaigns, then you don't want to wait for three to six months. It could, your targets could be more short-term. But again, you still need to have more long-term uh, targets and then they are supplemented by more short-term ones. So the answer is three to six months for most, but it could change based on the type of uh, team you work with. Thank you. All right, we have time for just one more question and then we'll have to close it out. Um, um, from the chat, we have a question about discovery, how does how that fits into the flow? And then um, another question about managing features post-launch. So I'll let you choose. <laughs> Got it. So when you said discovery, I assume you are talking about discovering the opportunities, having conversations with the customers or um, uh, the market in general, correct? Yeah, I think uh, product is, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that's what they mean. Lisa, Got it. So, someone else said. Yeah, so discovery, I, I had gave another talk at Product School a year ago and it was about how do we have continuous discovery? So my philosophy is discovery is a continuous process. While this, is, um, this cycle is happening, as a product manager, you're continuously talking with your customers and your internal customers and kind of keeping your list of hypotheses um, kind of up to date and then keeping them validated as much as possible. So that when you are at the quarterly planning meeting, you're not doing discovery by scratch. You've already been working for it last three months or what have you. So. Um, so you're ready for this planning session that you see here. And then as soon as you plan, as soon as the team is off to races, you again start your discovery full swing so that by the next quarter, you know, you're know you ready with your next set of hypotheses. And sometimes you have enough learning and uh, you, you don't need to be that aggressive about discovery, but in general, it's a continuous process. All right, well, thank you so much. And with that, we are going to have to close it out. We're cutting, uh, cutting um, into a little bit of time, but thank you so much, Yogesh, thank for that really insightful presentation and for everyone um, in the comments asking questions and for joining us today. Um, if you have any closing remarks or anything that you should like to leave us with. No, thank you so much for listening um, and for the great questions and insights. You can reach me at uh, at my email or stay in touch on my LinkedIn profile if you have any follow-up questions. But again, thank you Product School, Nikki, and everyone who attended the call today. Thanks a lot.